presenting your host for the Racecoin podcast, Jay. What's going on, my Racecoin fans? I'm joined by Kelvin van der Linde, a South African racing driver with Audi Sport. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to join the show. I've uh, been checking out the previous podcast, so it's cool to, to finally be on there. Yeah, so you started at the age of eight. I mean, I mean, these guys these days, that's like grandpa years, you know, people are starting at the age of like three. So how did you get started? What, what made you feel like, you know, this is what I want to do? Um, well, motorsport's been like part of my life pretty much since I, since I was like born, really, because my, my dad was a racing driver. My grandfather was a racing driver back in the day. So I was always um, at the racetrack in my, uh, in my pram and whatever. And um, yeah, it was basically my mom was also super involved, super enthusiastic. So there was nothing holding me back really to, to get going. Um, so yeah, the, the, the bug bit very early. And then obviously nowadays I'm in the generation of, let's say, sim racing, video games and stuff. So I had my, uh, my first PlayStation. I was always playing racing games and stuff. So um, yeah, like I said, I definitely the passion was there from day one. That's awesome. And how did they, I mean, did they give you a leg up? Did they give you tips? Like what kind of um, influence did they have in terms of not just inspiring you to go, but how involved were they as part of the journey? Um, well, I mean, in the beginning, it, it naturally, when you start karting, it always starts off as like a family thing. You go together with your mom and dad and uh, my younger brother, Sheldon, we went to the racetrack and it was more like a family thing on, on Sundays. We would have uh, the barbecue at the racetrack and We'd have our little camp and everything. So um, at that point, it really was just about spending time together. And it's like, I, I really have very fond memories about that. Um, but then obviously, as you start in um, progressing, getting a bit older, winning some championships, you obviously realize that it's getting a bit more serious. Um, and then that's how I naturally then made the, the progression to, to bigger things. Yeah, of course. And, you know, one of the things that is related to your family as well, that you beat your uncle's record by 142 days as the youngest South African um, uh, ever national champion so what was that yeah. like did he was he there on that day like how did it go down <laughs> um well yeah it was cool i mean uh, at that time it was uh, the bw polar cup which is a popular one make series in south africa and it was also for many years in germany um so i i got going in this championship i was 14 years old when i started um which was pretty unheard of at the time uh, nowadays they're all, all the young kids are actually doing that so it's nothing special <laughs> anymore but uh yeah at that time it was pretty a pretty big thing let's say um my uncle was there and obviously he was um yeah i mean what do you say really i mean records are there to get beaten so <laughs> from that point of view he was obviously happy and, and happy to see his uh, his nephew um basically taking on the the motorsport challenge you know the, the international challenge yeah that's awesome and the fact that he was there as well i guess you know it adds to the the thrill of it as well and yeah, one of the yeah. things that obviously um racing involves is a lot of adrenaline a lot of like um you know it's one of these sports that you really really um, have to be prepared to put yourself on the line for and so is it is this kind of um, something that seeps through into other aspects of life do you have any other kind of um, sports that you do things that you do outside of racing that are quite daring um, to be honest there's no real um, rush like I've experienced racing it's very difficult to get the same kind of um, intensity in any other sport um, I'm generally quite an active person so I, I try and um, do a lot of of outdoor activities like triathlons is, is kind of like the phase I'm in right now. Um, a lot, as a lot of racing drivers are, um, I like playing tennis quite often. So the, I really like being outdoors and playing, playing sports. Um, but at the same time, it's very hard to get that same kick. Like when you're going for a qualifying lap and you know, it's, it's all on the line. Um, hmm. so I, uh, at the moment it's, it's all good, but I think one day when I retire, hopefully in, the, in a very distant future, I think it'll be very difficult to find a replacement for that kind of kick. You, you say that it's a thrill. Um, and I, and I noticed that word instead of using the word pressure. Um, and I guess, you know, obviously this is your career. This is something that you're taking very seriously. You know, it's not something that you just do as a hobby. So naturally, um, there is a, a, a tribute of, pressure rather than a thrill so how do you manage to make it a thrill which is sounds you know more exciting more fun you know you're gonna just go and do your best rather than pressure of like oh crap if i lose this race i might lose my sponsor um i don't really um I, in the past i did see it like that i was i was driving on a lot of pressure and so on but nowadays i see it a little bit different i i see pressure as something completely different i see pressure more as the people that have that don't have anything um, in life, you know, the pressure is basically trying to put food on the table. You know, my home country, South Africa, um, where people um, live in, in huge poverty, I, I see that as pressure. Um, what I'm doing is basically a privilege. 
And um, for that reason, every time I'm on the racetrack, it's for me an opportunity just to do my best. Um, you know, when things work out good, it's it's obviously fantastic. But when it doesn't work out good, there's obviously a lot of things that I'm still very grateful for. Um, having been exposed to some of the things in my home country. So, um, yeah, like I said, I don't really see it as pressure. Um, some drivers see it a bit differently. Um, but, yeah, that's just my, my view on it. Mm, that's amazing that you describe it as a privilege to drive because, you know, in some senses, it, it definitely is. And, you know, a lot of people... Um, don't have this opportunity and it's first world problems right some people say so yeah I definitely I, I really agree with that and how did you manage to change that mentality from pressure to thrill um well it took a lot of time I mean I'm still pretty young I'm only 23 now but um early on I uh obviously you come into a to a championship like um like the GT racing scene is right now it's obviously a very high pressure environment uh, and naturally as a young guy you just uh want to prove yourself um, you're not really thinking about anything other than racing. So um, naturally, then it kind of becomes the, the end all of life, really. But now, as I get a bit older, obviously, I realize it's a bit, a bit more to life than just motorsport. I, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of see the bigger picture. And, and for that reason, I, I'm also thankful or, let's say, you know, realistic about my position. I'm thankful of what I have. And sometimes you just have to be very reflective as, a, as, a, as an athlete because it doesn't last forever. Um, for anybody um, so from that point of view that's just uh, the mindset that I adopted yeah pretty much since the last year I would say um, where I've just taken a bit more of a calm approach to my racing and uh, taken as a step-by-step -step. if things work out it's great if not life goes on and you and you find new challenges and new ways to to keep on going it's amazing man um, and it, it sounds like a really mature approach and like you've broadened your horizons so if motorsport isn't your world anymore, not the only thing in the, your, you know, your world anymore, what other things has expanded or kind of uh, joined the inner circle of things that you um, genuinely feel like this is something that you really care about? Um, well, I mean, obviously for me, very important is my family, my friends. I, uh, I don't really get to see my family as often as I would like to, obviously because I live in, in Europe and my family is still back home in South Africa. So from that point of view, it's very difficult. Um, at least my brother is in Europe now with me. So we spend a lot of time together. So we have a very, a very close um, bond uh, in that sense. We do everything together pretty much. Um, but yeah, I mean, back in the day when, when motorsport, let's say was my, was my all and everything. I, I spent a lot of weekends where things didn't go right. I would, come home and I would basically sit in my room and not you know not come out for a few days just because you have such an emotional attachment to it and it, it's not about just um saying that motorsport is is um basically not that important anymore it's still it's it is my life it's what I do on a weekly basis but um obviously I found ways just to not um um have be sad about it you know because if you spend mm. a lot of your time in life being sad then obviously that's that's not the way you want to go about it um so i try and spend a lot of time with my friends family they've they've really helped me to broaden my eyes and stuff like that and, and like i said taking on new passions um also just in the business world um exploring new opportunities doing different things like uh actually going into the coaching side helping people develop um young drivers back home in south africa seeing if i can um you know open the the um, or carve the path for them a bit a bit better. Um, that's basically my goal. You know, it's 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 not so much um, about just being focused on one thing. I just want to broaden my horizons for for after motorsport. You know. And you said you coach some people in South Africa. So while living in Europe, how do you manage to balance that out? Or do you fly back there? How does it work? Um, I mean, at the moment, it's not really. Um, I don't have a lot of time to be very hands on with the coaching. So it's more like let's say advice, um, kind of giving contacts, that kind of stuff. Um, being the first South African in the last few years that really, um, let's say, came in onto the GT scene as a factory driver, um, I think it, it has created a lot of opportunities for South Africans. As you see now, there's probably about five guys here in Europe doing a great job and in factory positions. And that was not really the case um, five or six years ago when I started. So I definitely think um, I've been able to build up the contacts that, that we need. And uh, obviously my... My passion lies with young drivers. I know how they felt and um, because from my own experience. So um, definitely trying to make their lives a bit easier um, is obviously um, something I would like to do.
And how do you kind of um, see yourself helping them? Because obviously you felt their pressure, you felt what they're kind of going through. So what sort of things do you help them with that, you know, you think that um, you didn't know when you maybe started or you felt like this was so overwhelming? Um, and what sort of pointers do you give? Uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, things when you come to Europe as, uh, let's say, so far away. Um, you know, South Africa is not at all um like the european motorsport scene so there's a lot to learn in terms of management for example the political side is completely different so i went through a lot of things uh in terms of management um a lot of things that probably um you know i don't want other people to go through again so the main thing is just kind of protecting them to to some of the dangers that that come with the thing there's a lot of people that always sometimes don't really want the best for you that's also a real reality of our sport um, so my goal is there to basically protect some of the guys um, from the things that I was exposed to coming coming to Europe, not knowing anybody really, and making a lot of wrong decisions. So my my goal is to give them the right contacts and lead them on the right way, so they don't make those mistakes that I made. That's amazing. And um, one of these things that you've managed to secure is the Audi Sport. Um, and uh, how did you manage to get this opportunity? And how did that all come about into? Um, well, it was it was quite a long story. I mean, uh, my my typical route into uh, GT racing was not um, like most young guys uh, nowadays. Most of the guys come through Formula cars. Um, I came through um, the touring car route, so um, through Polar Cup in South Africa, and then I came to one make series in Sirocco Cup, which was a German championship at the time. Uh, my parents really didn't have the finance to support my career um, all the way, so I had to find other ways. Um, one of the key points there was that there was a lot of prize money up for grabs for this championship. Um, so my parents said, look, we'll put everything in. We'll, we'll take um, a loan from the bank and we, we can afford to put you in for one season in this championship. And uh, from there, you've got to, you've got to spread your own wings and, and get it done by, your, by, your, by yourself. Um, so that's what I did. I went and won the championship. Thankfully enough, the first season um, was able to then get that prize money. And I invested that prize money then into um, a season of GT Masters, which at the time was um, and still is um, Germany and Europe's or one of the biggest GT championships in Europe. And um, yeah, the, the cards just aligned perfectly. Uh, I was able to win the championship then again in the first season, driving with Renner Rust, um, driving an Audi R8. So that's how the link then came to Audi um, naturally. So we, we had our first discussion, discussions at the end of 2014. At the time, I was still 18. So, um, yeah, my, my parents were part of the negotiations. I, I couldn't really negotiate on my own. <laughs> time. Um, it's right. different to nowadays. But, um, yeah, then I got offered my first Audi contract at that time, 18 years old. So that was a big step for me. And, um, yeah, that's basically how it's, how it's gone. And now we're here six years later still with Audi. And, you know, having won some some cool races and achieved some cool things. That's amazing. It's, it sounds like they, your parents have really, really gambled on a, a huge one-time bet and you... Well, I mean, that that is how it is. Um, let's say motorsport. I don't think there's any stories of guys that Of course, yeah, yeah. Very common. Very haven't common. taken a gamble, you know. It's a little bit like the stock stock market. It's like, um, yeah, you, you have to gamble sometimes and sometimes you win big. So, um, yeah, that's that's the gamble we took and luckily it paid off. All on black, yeah? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, I'm wearing black today. so <laughs> Exactly, exactly. It's <laughs> awesome. And um, what do you feel like sets you apart in all of this? Because obviously you've had um, a lot of success. You've got a lot of titles of the youngest, you know, of various, uh, various races that you've been part of. What do you feel like is different about your mentality towards motorsport when it's such a cutthroat business where everyone is, you know, has coaches, nutrition, training, um they're they're working day in day out they have sponsorship you know some people are um, self-funded through their parents sometimes and they're fortunate enough to do that and they have everything right there what do you feel is your kind of differentiating factor um well i think my story having come from a country that has basically no influence on the european racing market i was probably from the beginning very determined so um you know back in that day when like when i said to you it's i was the only south african at the time here uh trying to make a career in in europe so i knew it was uh all in basically i had no backup i know i had no plan b so i think like in any sport it's just basically that willpower of saying to yourself i'm not gonna lose i'm gonna make it work no matter what 
and um, that's basically how it worked out. And I, I'm really happy in that sense. Um, like I said, to have to have opened that that gateway for for other guys now. Um, as you can see, a lot of the South Africans now coming through and are actually showing their potential on the on the European scene. So, I think that's really what set me apart in the, in that sense. That's awesome. That's awesome. And one of the things that you've done to prove it is the <laughs> no Win, which is famously known as one of the hardest tracks in the, in the world. So, how did you manage that? Like, how did you manage to train for that and actually execute on that? Um, well, I mean, again, it's in racing. It's quite often about um, timing and being at the right place at the right time. Um, I went through a difficult phase in Europe at that time, um, just having a bit of bad luck in all the sprint championships I was taking part in. Uh, things just weren't really coming together. And uh, yeah, Audi took a bit of a gamble on me for Nürburgring. I'd never driven on the track before. I'd never done the race before. So it was a massive gamble. Um, I actually took my road car before the first race. Um, we normally do the VLN races before mm -hmm. the 24 hour to, to prepare. And I actually took my road car there um, a week in advance before the first VLN. I was actually just doing laps around the Nordschleife life of my road car. Um, <laughs> you know, nobody really knew about it at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, that definitely, those small things and that, that, that will to succeed definitely helped in that case. And then, of course, being on the right car with the right teammates definitely helped in that moment. Um, and yeah, if you can remember back to the race, it was probably one of the craziest 24 hour races, or at least the, the craziest hot last half an hour to a 24 hour race, I think ever, um, with the whole rain scenario and, you know, tire choice, the fuel nozzle coming undone. It, it was all crazy, but like I said, you know, sometimes in life when the stars align, they, you know, it's just meant to be. So, and, um, yeah, that race basically kicked everything off for me because, um, it really, it gave me a. Uh, let's say a stepping point for my career to really go into more endurance races and then prove myself in, in various different um, endurance races. The stars seem to be really aligning for you quite a lot. I have yeah. to say. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. Looking, looking at it back now, and always when I chat to, to guys for, for podcasts like this, it's, uh, it's quite amazing looking back what, how the things have played out, you know, basically coming from nothing and then just everything working out as it should. Um, it's cool to think of back of it like that, but um, you know, Nash as a driver, you go through phase, you always want more, and that's a little bit at the phase where I'm at in my in my life right now. I I want new challenges and something different, so I'm always exploring different opportunities now to to try something different, not just in GT racing and maybe try something else. Um, but then again, like I said, when I chat to guys like you and look back at what we've achieved so far, it's, it's obviously very cool. And then, you know, I'm just grateful again and, and let's say content with, with I what like I've got. I feel you're really going to drop a beat for me and be like, we started from the bottom, now we're here and just start rapping. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I only do those in the shower, unfortunately. <laughs> in the shower, in the shower. <laughs> I guess this podcast was a bit too late. Um, so yeah. one, of the, one of your dreams is obviously to win Le Mans, right? 24 hours. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, if what is, obviously there's, you know, the the prestigiousness of that race naturally but if you do win someday that's another goal and another um you know uh master you want to reach so if you do win that and let's say you win that again what would you really want to do beyond that is there another goal beyond that or is that where the current furthest trajectory of where you see um your career going uh, I mean, you never really know in life, like what opportunities come up and what, what life presents you. Um, so, I mean, for sure, Lamar, winning Lamar would already be like a massive achievement for me. I think um, I would be pretty content with that. But, you know, looking further down the line, if I was in that situation, I'd probably want more. I mean, that's just the natural <laughs> human thing. You always want more. Um, so, yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, Brendan Hartley went from um, basically, he got kicked out of Red Bull went to one Lamar, ended up in F1. Um, I'm not saying I'm going to end up in F1, but, you know, it just shows you what can happen. <laughs> just, just dropping hints. Just dropping <laughs> hints. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just shows you what can happen. So, um, yeah, I think in this business, you have to be a little bit open-minded because um, you can be hit with a few surprises. Um, my personal goal, at least, would be to win all the major endurance races at the moment. So, um, I've already got one uh, with Nürburgring. That was one of the top ones on my list, obviously. Um, but then, of course, it's 20 hours of Spa, 20 hours of Daytona. Um, Bathurst 12 Deep hours actually becoming quite a popular event now so I mean there's still quite a few I'd like to win and um, like I said my goal would be to tick all of them off um, before I retire one day one day that, that's a that's a that's gonna yeah be I mean very day. far in the future I'm only 23 so hopefully <laughs> of course of course and what, what would you say to people who are out there who are chasing their dreams you know what kind of message would you like to leave with them 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like cliche things out there, like saying, you know, never give up on your dreams and, you know, hard work and all that things. I, I, I tend to want to actually go a little bit away from the cliche stuff. I think, you know, you have to just um, see, be very realistic sometimes. You know, you have to be realistic of, um, of what opportunities you have, what, what is possible for you. I mean, of course, the mind is a very powerful thing. I've, I've experienced that a few times in my career. So um, definitely having that, that mindset is, is very important, first of all. And uh, then it's, um, yeah, just, just getting, getting into it. You know, um, you have to put in the hours, of course. Um, that, is, that is no cliche. That is, that is a bit of a fact. Um, you have to put in the hours for whatever you want to do in life. Um, but generally, it's um, for, for racing, it, it's, there's no clear line. You know, like I said, you have to be lucky sometimes. You have to get the right brakes. Um, but for a young driver, I mean, go out there, expose yourself to the racing, um, and basically let, let the story run itself. You know, um, that, that's the best advice I can give. It's not, not have too many expectations coming into it because um, motorsport is a bit of a lottery sometimes. It can go really good or it can go really bad. So go in open-minded into the thing and do your best. And other than that, you really can't do much more. You know, the stars need to align sometimes. And yeah, that's just part of it. What I got from that, uh, one of the major points I got from that was uh, let the story run itself. And that really shows your mindset of kind of the take back approach of as much as I want this, as much as I love this, as much as this is my life, I'm still kind of in some sense letting history write itself with my own life. As, yeah, as it goes. I mean, you, as people, we... We, nowadays the whole uh, all the technology and stuff we we have this mindset of we can we can influence everything in life and unfortunately that's not really the case I, at least i don't see it like that um i'm quite a religious person i believe in uh, you know if it's meant to be it's meant to be so um that's that's the kind of mindset i carry out through my racing and, and my my daily life so yeah that that's the only advice i can really give to the young guys out there awesome Kevin. thank you very much for your wise words and it's been a pleasure having you on the race coin podcast Thank you very much. Um, it's always a pleasure. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the podcast wherever you're listening from, um, whether it's on the way home from work or uh, if you're lying uh, a bit bored on, uh, on the couch or whatever. I hope you guys enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Thanks. If you like this episode of the Racecoin podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you can get notified every Monday when a new episode is out. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.